now, three minutes to go in the closing bell, everybody. The Dow holding on to some of the best gains today, up over 200 points. The Nasdaq also up over, over uh, let's see, nicely here today, up uh, uh, 34. And of course, everything's up about 2%. Melissa Lee is joining me, and that's the bottom line. I mean, look at the market internals. Ten times as much up volume as down volume. Most of that, all, all the trading's going to all the stocks on the upside. We is there anything not, not to that. like? Is anybody complaining to you about anything? Oh, I mean, a 200-point rally, Bob, how can you possibly complain? You know, we were commenting earlier about even the volume, and even the volume in the past half hour has picked up. What we have seen is we have backed off some of the best levels of the day. And at the margin, right now, it does seem like energy stocks have weakened. In fact, we were also commenting before that ExxonMobil had turned positive. It's actually turned negative. And that, at the margin, is pushing the Dow off the well, best well, level. What's up with so that? Is that because the... Obviously, oil's down three days in a row. Is that the big problem with them, or are they doing something else with these energy stocks? That, there's just a natural rotation out of energy with oil down. They're buying the rest of the market. There are other places in the market that right now look a little bit more promising. Bank stocks, extremely strong on the day, and certainly seen historically as the beneficiaries of whenever the Fed pauses or stops hiking interest rates. Those are the typical stocks that seem to benefit. And, of course, we saw J.P. Morgan positive comments today, Bank of America positive comments. I mean, remember a week and a half ago, we we were, talk we were here talking about AMD, what a sour tone they hit, EMC, 3M. It seemed like we were off to a crummy start. Now that we're getting a lot more stocks coming in, some of the big guys are having much more positive things Especially when it comes to the financial services sector, we have to remember is we need leadership out of the financial services sector in order to hold on to rallies longer term. Financial services being the biggest component of the S&P 500. So certainly when we get good news out of the likes of the J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, the number three and number two U.S. Bank respectively, that bodes well for the overall market. And where do we go from here? I guess that's what traders have been asking me. You know you're in trouble, folks. When traders ask you what's going on, that's good. Pisani's law, you know you're in trouble. But what <laughs> happens from this point on? I mean, now we've really, Bernanke has given a little bit of a nice lift to the, the stock market. Now, if we've got to get the earnings there, and now the economy really has to moderately slow down. If it slows down a lot faster than that, the stock market is going to react. It's going to be about direction. earnings for at least the next couple of days. I mean, tomorrow alone, we've got 43 S&P. 500 companies reporting. So the earnings pace is certainly not slowing down. And what is going on with oil? Because that has really jerked the markets around uh, in the past few days, ever since the conflict in the Middle East started. And so we're going to really have to watch that and conduct those earnings in order for people to feel a little bit comfortable with where we are in the markets right now. But the bottom line, folks, is very simple. Mr. Bernanke has eliminated a lot of the bearish sentiment down here. He's caused a lot of the shorts to cover the market, to cover their short positions right now. Heaven knows, Melissa, they may start instituting shorts again tomorrow, but they'll certainly be a little more cautious about doing that right now. So we're ending the day over 200 points on the Dow. Not quite the best percentage gain on the year. I think 217 is what we needed, but still, we'll take it. And there's the closing bell here. Here at the New York Stock Exchange, ringing the closing bell, FBL Financial Group, celebrating its 10th anniversary, CEO William Adi, and over at the NASDAQ, the Texas Secretary of State, Roger Williams. And there we are, closing Dow up 210 points. The closing bell is next with Maria Bartolomeo. Hi, everybody. A major rally on Wall Street today, and we have every angle covered for you. We're waiting on earnings from four technology bellwethers at any moment now. Intel, eBay, Motorola, and Apple coming out momentarily. But first, Wall Street is calling it the Bernanke Rally. The bull's out on a buying spree today for stocks. The Dow Industrial is logging its biggest one-day gain this year and the best percentage move in three years. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke calming investor nerves today with his comments on taming inflation. That's fueling speculation the Fed will soon stop raising interest rates and will likely take a pause at the next August meeting. The rally was already underway early in the session before for Bernanke's testimony, triggered by a fairly tame inflation data out this morning. The consumer price index rising two-tenths of a percent in the month of June. That was the smallest gain in four months and right in line with expectations. Strip out the volatile food and energy prices, the CPI was up three-tenths of a percent, slightly more than expectations. Take a look at how the market ended today's trading session, and it is one for the record books. Up 212 points on the industrial average, 2% higher at 11,011. NASDAQ finishing just about at the high of the afternoon with a 2% rally there as well, 37 points higher at 2,080. And the broader average, S&P 500 up 1.8% on the session, 23 points higher at 1,259. We've got all the bases covered from Wall Street to Capitol Hill. Melissa Lee at the big board. Rick Santelli at the Chicago
Michael Merck and Hampton Pearson in Washington. We kick it off on Wall Street with Melissa Lee, our eye on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Take it away, Melissa. Hi there, Maria. And traders down here are saying thank you, Ben Bernanke, because it was his commentary that really provided the fuel for this rally. Certainly, there were other factors at play. You mentioned the tame CPI report. Also, oil being pretty much below 73 bucks a barrel for the entire session. That also helped. Also, seeing the 10-year yield uh, dropping to uh, about 5.06 percent, that certainly also helped the markets here. What we saw today, we saw the Dow push through the 200-day moving, 200 moving average and then push even higher. The AD line, extremely positive, 10 to 1 right now, and we are seeing broad-based strength across sectors, even the Russell 2000 managing to make some pretty strong gains in the session. Take a look at some of the bank stocks. These certainly were the big winners. Of course, banks usually seen as a beneficiary of whenever the Fed stops its rate-raising campaign. Although, keep in mind that there is some interesting commentary out of the banks, despite the better-than-expected earnings. J.P. Morgan throwing up some flags about credit quality, saying that will, in fact, deteriorate in the next quarter. Bank of America also saying that it wants to push and push big time into the mortgage business and even explore the area of subprime lending, which, by the way, was the area specifically mentioned by Ben Bernanke in his testimony as being an area of concern. PNC, Mellon Bank, all of those posting better than expected earnings uh, today. Keep in mind, though, whether or not the rally will continue will be predicated on how the earnings picture is tomorrow. Take a look at the short list on the earnings picture here. Three Dow components, so these will be key in tomorrow's session to whether or not the rally will, in fact, continue. Maria. Let's get the detail of what the chairman said exactly. Ben Bernanke fueling the rally today, but did he really say anything that was truly new? Seems he's Hampton Pearson on Capitol Hill with the highlights. Hampton. Hi, Maria. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke began two days of testimony here on Capitol Hill by hitting the economic equivalent of a Grand Slam home run, circling the bases, if you will, with a message of moderation. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke says the U.S. economy still faces inflation risk, but slower growth and the lag effects of 17 Fed interest rate hikes should ease inflation pressures in the coming months. FOMC participants project that the growth in economic activity should moderate to a pace close to that of the growth of potential, both this year and next. Should that moderation occur as anticipated, it should also help to limit inflation pressures over time. And he said that moderation should not lead to a recession. Our forecast is for the economy to grow near potential and for inflation to moderate, and so that's consistent with what Congress has charged us to do. Um, I don't see a recession as being very likely. Um, you can never rule out anything. Yes, the Fed chief says there are risks in both directions, pushing rates too high and damaging the economy, or not doing enough to curb inflation. And he said policymakers are focused on not overshooting. Clearly, we don't want to tighten too much to cause the uh, economy to grow more slowly than its potential. And we are very aware of that concern. And we think about it and we look at it, try to evaluate it. Now, tomorrow, the Fed chairman plays the House of Representatives, where his message of a slower housing market and less consumer spending may not exactly be message uh, to the members over there who will be facing the voters this fall. Maria? All right, Hampton, thanks very much. And during that testimony, Mr. Bernanke was grilled on how the markets have performed since he took over at the Federal Reserve. Since he was sworn in, the Dow is down six-tenths of a percent, the S&P 500 down three-and-a-half percent, and the Nasdaq down nearly 13 percent. Since his mea culpa, or what he called, quote, a lapse of judgment, referring to his answers to my questions to him in Washington at the end of April, the Dow and S&P have fallen about 5 percent, and the Nasdaq is down 13 percent. And since the Fed's rate increase in May, the Dow and S&P down 7 percent, Nasdaq down 14 percent. Bond yields today falling to their lowest levels in six weeks. CNBC's Rick Santelli at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange with that angle. Rick? You know, it was a two-punch bowl party in interest rate land. Look at these charts intraday, 2, 5, 10. That CPI data on the headline was calm, but boy, traders were looking at year-over-year -year core. It moved up to 2.6. You'd have to go back to December of 01 to find a higher number. It pushed the two years up close to five and a quarter, pushed fives up to 515, pushed tens up to 516, and then at 10 Eastern, it all changed. The bottom fell out. Rates now, as you said, towards six-week lows. But think about this. 
The only issue out of twos, fives, and tens that spent even one day above five and a quarter, which is the overnight rate as of June 30th, was the two-year note. One session. They've never been there, but they almost covered the complete ground today. And indeed, with a 505 on the tens, best yield closed since the 13th of June. The one fly in the ointment was the dollar. Look at the dollar index. It only gave up about two-thirds of a cent, but an important two-thirds of a cent. And if there's still some flight to safety based on the Middle East, there could be more coming out. But traders are going to continue to monitor that. And the fact that Fed fund futures now closing in on only 60%. Four hours ago, that was over 90. Maria, back to you. Hi, Rick. Thanks so much. And it was a big day for the Dow Industrials. The index recording a triple-digit gain today for a closer look at today's rally. I'm joined now by Jim Bianco. He's president of Bianco Research and CBC's Ron and Son. The quarterly results right to Silicon Valley we go. Our bureau chief there, Jim Goldman, with the breakdown. Jim. Stand by one second. Um, we've got the numbers right here, Maria. Let me just go through them with you because they are pretty significant. I'm on the phone right now with Ed Snyder, who's an analyst who covers this sector. And, you know, these numbers look really good at this point. Uh, earnings per share, when you back out the, uh, the one-time gains that the company enjoyed on the quarter, and it looks like 33 cents is the number we're looking at here. 30 cents is what the street had anticipated. Uh, revenue really just uh, skyrocketing on the quarter. 10 point $88 billion is what Motorola is reporting on the top line. $10.08 billion is what the street was looking for. So just really surging business here. And look no further than the company's handset business. That's really where the gains are seen. The street looking for 48 million mobile devices sold by uh, Motorola. The company coming in at a whopping 51.9 million, just absolutely flooring some of the people on the street. 7.14 billion dollars in revenue just on the mobile devices alone. So at first blush, this looks like to be a very strong report from Motorola. We had indications that the company was basically losing ground to the likes of Nokia and Research in Motion, but this would seem to indicate that indeed those concerns may have been unfounded. The company will begin its conference call shortly, but uh, right now, looking at that. 33 cent number, Motorola beating by 10 percent. This is very good news for Motorola investors. Maria, we've got lots more coming over the course of the next 30 minutes, and we'll bring them to you as soon as we get them. All back right, Jim, you. nice work. Work on the phones there. We'll get back to you soon. Let me get back to our conversation. Jim Bianco, Motorola says uh, it's seeing continuing momentum in the mobile devices business. Obviously, a good quarter from the company. Is the business sector strong enough to offset any weakness that may come down the line uh, from the consumer sector? You know, it's always been a good bet over the last several years to bet on the upside with the economy. It seems to always surprise everybody on the upside. So at this point, I think that if you're ever confused or ever unsure, take the upside. And I would say yes, that it would. And I would take the upside. And yet, Ron, we're seeing a handful of uh, pre-announcements in the tech sector. And that certainly has been one area of the market. That I'll get back to that uh, soon. Thanks so much for joining us. Intel is out on the wires with its second quarter. Right back to Jim Goldman. He's watching the numbers on Intel. What have you got, Jim? Yeah, Maria, kind of a mixed bag here from the world's largest chip maker. 15 cents in EPS, uh, 13 or 14 cents is what the street was looking at, depending upon who you talk to. But looks like Intel beats by a penny. That's the good news. That even better news comes on lighter than expected revenue, if you can sort of make that equation. $8.01 billion is what the company reporting. The street was closer to $8.3 billion. But here's where the company reaches some kind of a glitch. The company uh, reports 49% in gross margins. That's right in line with what the street was anticipating. But the real problem here is what the company's new outlook, and I stress new outlook is for the rest of this year, guiding to 8.3 to $8.9 billion for the September quarter. Consensus was at $9.1 billion, and that original range was $8.8 .8 to $9.4 billion. So Intel's about a half billion dollars light in revenue, more disturbing for Intel shareholders. The company has now revised lower its gross margin outlook for the rest of the year to 49 percent. That number had been at 53 percent. The company also reporting significant weakness in just about every market it does business in. European uh, markets down 19 percent. Japan 13 percent. The Americas 10 percent. Asia was really the best performer for Intel because that market was only down 
six percent. Uh, the real question now, talking to John Lau at Jeffries and Company just now, what does this mean for advanced micro devices when that Intel rival reports tomorrow? If Intel is seeing this kind of softness, the real question, as we had with Yahoo and Google yesterday, is Intel's problem because of AMD, or is this an industry problem that AMD will also suffer from? We're going to dig a little deeper on these numbers, but at first blush, anyway, looking at Intel for the rest of the year, uh, those concerns that were uh, sort of founded through the course of this quarter seem to be founded now for the rest of the year as investors wonder just when Intel might be able to turn itself around. We will be speaking with Intel CFO Andy Bryant and we'll bring you those, company, those comments in a first on CNBC interview coming up at 5.30 Eastern on Cudlow & Company. Maria, back to you. We'll get a little deeper and, and bring you more. eBay just coming across as well. We'll get those numbers for you in just a few seconds. All right, Jim, thanks very much. We're going to uh, look at eBay's report and get back to Jim with uh, the latest on eBay. Meanwhile, the Mideast is a hotbed of unrest, so you might be surprised to see how many businesses are actually thriving right now despite the violence. Our Carl Quintanilla is giving you an inside look at companies in the center of the crisis. Plus, new life for the electric car. Many have failed, but now a Silicon Valley entrepreneur is targeting affluent drivers with a new and much faster model. You'll see it here first. And it's worked for millions of smokers. Now a patch holds promise for millions of people trying to save their memories in the battle against Alzheimer's. You're watching The Closing Bell on CNBC, first in business worldwide. Announcing.